Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We're going to work through the balance of this portion of Scripture that we've been working on. We have uh, spent four months in Acts chapter 6 and 7. Four months. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm only here once. <laughs> Us, so. <laughs> but, we love it. but it sounds it sounds like really good expository preaching. Four months, two chapters. Um, we're going to work our way through the end of um, chapter seven, Acts chapter seven. Uh, started back, I guess, February uh, with this kind of series. I call it Stephen Speaks, and I thought it was pretty cool. You guys were kind of doing Acts in your Sunday school. Are you, are you done with it? We just finished it. Today, 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 today. Um, so it's been, and I, just, I, I just love it when the Lord allows that to happen. I kind of overheard a little bit of what you uh, taught about this morning. And our passage probably ends on the same note um, that you guys, I think, uh, ended today. But today we're going to kind of add this little line here, this this. This quotation, behold, I see the Son of Man Stand. standing. Amen. <laughs> uh, those of you who know the passage know where I'm, where I'm going. Um, those of you who may not know the passage, Stephen is standing in front of the Sanhedrin. And they have just asked him, hey, are the charges that have been brought to you by these leaders of this particular synagogue, are they true? And so Stephen is giving a defense. Not necessarily to get himself out of a tough pickle, but he's giving a defense and he's laying some things out. And so he, as far as I can see, he starts his defense simply by saying, hey, can't you see what's going on here? Like, can't you see what you've done? And that's, that's kind of where he starts. And he ends his defense by saying, hey, I see the Son of Man standing, Amen. et cetera. We'll get to that. Um, what, what I proposed last time we were here was that you, you realize that he's, he's giving in his defense an account of Jewish history. The history of these Israelites, the history that brought these uh, leaders, these priests in the Sanhedrin to where they are. But he rushes through it like he's just giving like a, like a freight train. But he makes certain stops. And I think it's interesting to look at where Stephen stops. So just if you go to this next slide, uh, I gave out, there should be on your chairs an outline if you want to follow. I'm going to try to fill in the gaps here. But really quickly, here, here, here are the stops that he's made so far. Number one, he reminded them that Abraham was the father of the nation. To which these individuals who are accusing him or charging him or questioning him, they, they get that. Yeah, absolutely. Abraham, that's our father. We point our history, our lineage back to Father Abraham. And he reminds us that, that Abraham was a sojourner. He, 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 he didn't necessarily have a land of his own, although he had a promise for a land. But he was a sojourner. He was passing through. He was moving from place to place. That's kind of what he was. But he was promised a people, a, a descendants. And he was promised a people that would actually take the promised land. But what's interesting is he, and he mentions, Stephen mentions it, foreigners would mishandle his people. But God would then judge those who mishandled his chosen people, his anointed people, his set apart people. Foreigners were going to mishandle them. They enslaved them, but God would judge those people that mishandled them. Abraham. Then he just drives the train a little bit further, but his next stop, interesting, is Joseph. He skips Isaac, he skips Jacob, he stops on Joseph. And he reminds the individuals in front of him that Joseph's own brothers were jealous of him and mishandled him. Selling him into slavery. What I think is interesting is that he never really refers to Joseph's brothers. He says the patriarchs <laughs> betrayed him. So the patriarchs did. I don't know if you get what he's saying there, but he's kind of 
he's, he's making it a little bit personal for these Sanhedrin members who say we 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 date our or we 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 look at our inheritance from Abraham and the patriarchs. He says that's what the patriarchs did. They betrayed him. That's right. Interesting. But he said, although the patriarchs mishandled Joseph, God rescued him, actually gave him favor and wisdom. And then he drives the train a little bit further. He pauses on Moses. And he reminds them, hey, Moses, after a time, when he's an adult, he's sent back to Egypt. So he kind of talks about, you know, you know, being in front of God. But he, he reminds them when Moses is sent back to Egypt, and Stephen refers to Moses as this Moses whom they rejected. This is in verse 35, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man, this Moses, God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out. This man, that guy, they mishandled him. They, they rejected him. His own people rejected him. And he was the guy that God was sending to lead them out. I look at what, Joseph, what, what, what Stephen is saying, and I'm looking at the patterns. And when you read the Bible, sometimes, sometimes you can't spend too much time on the names. Sometimes you've got to look behind the names and find the pattern. What is it that, that God is trying to reveal about himself? And I think there's a pattern that we see here in Scripture. Because through the patterns of how God does things, God is revealing his, how he's operating in history. He's using fallible human beings to redeem his people whom he loves. He's redeeming his people. He loves us. We're children of God. We're children of the Most High God. He loves us. And he's got a plan in place to redeem us. And he's using fallible human beings to do this. But he remains the same. So, sometimes you got to just look at the stories and look how they kind of string together. Look how Stephen is stringing together. Stephen is making a point to these individuals. I'm going to continue where we left off. We left off in, in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 35. So see if you can read along with me. Again, this Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? Let me pause real quick. Why does he stay, spend time on Moses? If you remember back in chapter 6, the accusation against Stephen is that he's talking bad about Moses and God. Like they're saying, we're, our accusation against him is he's speaking against Moses. And Stephen gets to this point where he says, well, this same Moses, this guy, the patriarchs, our people rejected him. Saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. And our fathers refused to obey him. Interesting. But thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Israel, we don't know what happened to him, what's become of him. And so they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Interesting. Catch the pattern here. He's saying, you know, same thing that happened with Abraham and our people, the same thing that happened with Joseph, same thing that happened with Moses. These people that God has sent to redeem his people, our people rejected him. In fact, they saw Moses leave them out they, they, they know he talked with, with God. He actually had tablets that were inscribed by the hand of God. He had the law of God. And they were so ignorant. They rejected him. Said, send us back to Egypt. Back to our slavery. Back to our slavery. Back to how great we had it back there when we were enslaved and had nothing. 
But we're not going to follow this guy, Moses, who God called to deliver. Interesting. But God, verse 42, and this is the this is the hard part here. God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. God gave them over to their sin. That's the, the, the that is a scary truth, but it is a truth. If we reject God because we love our sin, there comes a point in God's divine sovereignty where he will give you over to your sin. Romans 1. Ouch! God turned away and gave them over to worship the hosts of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, did you bring me, bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, your God, Rephon, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. I'm going to keep going. Our fathers, this is an interesting stop on the train. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he spoke, he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. I think this is an interesting stop here, because he jumps from Moses, and his next stop is the tabernacle. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. Interesting. That's interesting. In fact, for me, that's confusing unless you watch for the pattern. David, who found favor with the Lord, and I have this in your notes, David sought to make a tabernacle that was permanent. God had given instructions for a tabernacle that was sojourning. It was moving with the people, and he promised, I will follow you, I will be, I will lead you, cloud, fire, like I will lead you. There was a temper, temporary, temporary, temporal. <laughs> of this tabernacle. David comes along and says, you know what, I've got this grand palace. You know who deserves a grand palace? You do, God. You deserve something that's big and grand and permanent. So God, let me build that for you. Interesting. Doesn't sound bad, does it? Sounds pretty noble. God says, well, you're not going to do it. Your son will do it. In fact, um, uh, Stephen uh, says that. Stephen, uh, where are we? But verse 47, but it was Solomon who built a house for him. So in your notes here, David sought to make a tabernacle um, that was permanent. It was entering God's presence to a permanent grand structure. The peoples lost their focus. They misprioritized the maker and what was made. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, 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 where Stephen stops here. He says, look at the pattern. We're missing what God is doing because we're so focused on what we think we want that we're rejecting what God is setting forward. David says, hey, we're going to build you a grand house, something that's permanent, something that looks like every other palace, of noble to, we got to build it. And God says, no, that's, that's not what I asked you for. I gave you the model for a, tent, a tabernacle, the tent. David says, no, we, we want something permanent. We want something big. Matter of fact, at this time where Stephen's uh, speaking, you've got a second temple in place. Yeah. And it's there. They got angry with Jesus because they said, you're, you're talking against the temple. This is the temple of God. This is David's idea. Matter of fact, it says, verse 48, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. 
What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all these things? People misprioritize. They missed the maker and what he has made. And they came to the point where they were worshiping what he made and not who made it. And God says, no, this, this, this structure here, and he says it to Solomon. Right? Solomon says, oh, can, will you really dwell? Will you really live there? Aren't you bigger than that? And God says, no, but when you pray to this, I'll hear, I'll answer. So I'll recognize what it is, but don't miss appropriate what you've made for who the maker is. Right. Did not my hand make all these things? Mm -hmm. We can miss what God is doing because we're so focused on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We can miss what God is doing because sometimes we get so focused on what we're doing. We miss it. That seems to be where Stephen stops on this train. It says we missed it with Abraham and his descendants. We missed it with Joseph. We missed it with Moses. We missed it with the tabernacle. We're so focused on what we can do and what we're doing, what we're expecting, that we're missing what God was doing. And he says that's happened all through our history, Sanhedrin. Stephen is not rejecting the Sanhedrin. He's really not distancing himself from the faith. Stephen was Jewish. Greek-speaking, but he was Jewish. And for him, he would look at Christianity. It wasn't called Christianity at this point. But he would look at Christianity as a completion of his Jewish faith. That's right. He's saying all the promises that we know, all of the counts that we know in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, Everything that we know, every story, every prophecy, it's leading to this man, Jesus, who has arrived. That's right. I don't know if you ever heard of this name, uh, Dr. Michael Brown. Yeah. Um, Dr. Michael Brown is a speaker. He's, his um, degrees are in, um, what do they call it? Hebrew, but it's um, ant what is it? antique uh, languages. What do you call it? Uh, what do you call it? Old. Ancient. Ancient languages. So Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, Greek is kind of what his, 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 um, his, his degree is in. And he's got a Jewish background. He gave, I remember listening to him, and he's talked about interacting with an individual who was a Jewish Christian. And he's commented to the guy, when did you convert to Christianity? And he said, the guy said, no, 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 no. You got that wrong. He said, we Jews who are Christians, we weren't converted. We were completed. He said, you who were a non-Jew who became a Christian, you're converted. That's right. But in fact, we're completed. Stephen would have that philosophy. Stephen would say, no, I'm a Jewish man just like you guys are. <coughs> what we saw in the Messiah, what we saw in Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. His presence has completed what we know to be true. All the promises. So he's not there ripping down their faith. He's saying, no, guys, can't you see what we've done? We misappropriated what God was doing because we were so stuck on what we were trying to do, and we missed it. We mishandled God's promises. That's right. And then verse 51, he brings it home here. If you don't believe me, he says, verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears, that would hurt them because they were of the circumcision. That's right. Of course we're cir circumcised. Yeah, but your heart is not. He says, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. Ooh, that must have made them mad. Just like your fathers did, just like the patriarchs did, just like our ancestors did, you Always reject the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, whenever God by His Spirit is moving, we reject it. You always reject it. Verse 52. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the killing of the righteous one. 
whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Really current now. Next stop on the train today. Probably five years prior, maybe. It says, if we look at our history, guys, which of the prophets that God sent by his spirit to speak to us had, did we not persecute and kill? Like over and over, this is our habit. Look at history. This is what we've done. God has shown up. God has tried to say something. He's tried to do something. And we destroyed it. We knocked it down. <laughs> Even up to just recently, what we just did, what you just did to the Messiah. He said, you, you who received the law as delivered by angels, but you did not keep it. Really current. Really personal. He's following a pattern. He's saying, we have a pattern of how we've operated, guys, and this is our chance to change it. Like, this is your moment, Sanhedrin, to change it. To not reject what God is doing in our day, in our age, right now. This is our moment, guys. It's not that I'm talking bad about the temple. I'm not talking bad about, about Moses, about God. I'm trying to say, can you see what God is doing? What he's done and what we've missed in the past? Verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. They ground their teeth at him. F.F. F. Bruce is a, is a scholar. He's a biblical scholar. Uh, and he, in one of his commentaries... He said, um, he doesn't think that they, they interrupted him. He says, I wonder if Stephen was done. <laughs> Stephen kind of put the period at the end, like, I'm done. This is my presentation. I'm done. We don't know. It, I, I read it. And I always thought he's, they interrupted him. They got so angry and they just, you know, I don't know. But this is all God allowed to be recorded. At this moment, they were so angry, they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Pause on that. Think about that. Just think about that. He just went through this history, which he knew was not going to make the Sanhedrin smile. He knew, he knew the masses were not going to say, whoa, whoa, okay, you changed my mind. They get so enraged, maybe they started reaching for stones, maybe they started re reaching for ropes, maybe they started, you know, I don't know, yelling things out. They were enraged. And he looks and he says, man, I, I see the Lord, I see the Son of Man. Stand. I see him standing at the right hand of the Father. I see him. I see him. Nothing else in that moment mattered to Stephen. Is he about to get killed? He is. He knows where he's going. He knows where he's going. Right. And he sees who he's going to be with. That's right. Yes, amen. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> he can take the beating. He can take the pain. He can take the rejection. He could take whatever they're throwing out at him because he's looking and he sees the Lord. Amen. He has given his life to Jesus. And in this moment, God has given him a glimpse of where he's going when he leaves this place. Amen. Steve, Amen. I love, you know, we've spoken probably in brief for the past four months. Well, for the past few months after you lost your wife. And you say uh, one phrase probably every time we talk, and you say, I know where she yes. is. Amen. And you throw in, I'm going to go there too. Yeah. Man. There are people on this earth who have no clue where they're going. Right. That's right. They don't know. Some of them don't care. They don't know. They don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, so much of them don't want to know. They don't know. Because they don't know him. Stephen knew him. Stephen knew the Lord. Stephen knew Jesus. Stephen knew where he was going. If there's anyone in here and you don't know the Lord, you want to know the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Mm-hmm. If there's anything I know about this church, there's a bunch of people here in this church, this church body, that will share Christ with you. They don't want you to go anywhere other than heaven to be with the Lord Amen. when your right. time comes. And everybody's time will come to leave this earth. That's right. All of us. That's right. All of us. And I love it. Stephen is standing there at probably the worst moment of his life for the onlooker. And he says, ah, I, see I see the Lord. I see him standing at the right. The son of man standing at the right hand of God. I see him. Amen. I see him. That's right. I'll say what I have to say. I know where I'm going. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid. I'll say I'll do what I've got to do. I see him. I know where I'm going. Going home. Going home. Oh, I love that, Stephen. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He had to say, Lord Jesus, get me out of here. Lord Jesus, ouch, this hurts. Lord Jesus, why'd you let this happen take to you? Me Lord? Home. No, take me home. Take me. Here we are. I'm, I'm, let's go. Oh, I love that. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he said this, he fell asleep. I'm done. I'm out of here. That's what he said. I'm That's not right. saying that. That's what he said. <laughs> Chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Here's what I want to leave you with. You know who was watching? You know who's watching this? Other than the Lord. Apparently he's watching. But here on the earth, you know who's watching? I, I believe there are multitudes of people that are watching. And I believe there are several priests that are watching. Why do I say that? Because back in chapter 6, verse uh, 7, it says, The word of God continued to increase. The numbers of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, where he is, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. My guess is on this day, there are several priests that are there watching this young man who was asked to help wait tables. Preach the gospel. And he's preaching the gospel to the death. You know what else, that, who else is there? Saul was there. Saul was there. Uh, verse 58. Um, they stoned him and they laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. 8 chapter 1, 8, 8 verse 1. Saul approved of his execution. Saul is there. Soon to be the Apostle Paul, probably in the next year. He's there. He's watching this. You know what I think is there? I'm guessing. I don't know, but I'm guessing Barnabas is probably there. Because he's in that region at this point. He was wealthy. His family was wealthy. Uh, he had some stature, some status. He's, he's been there with the apostles. He was there when they chose Stephen. I'm guessing that Barnabas, is a good possibility that Barnabas was there or somewhere near. I, I'm just guessing. I'm guessing if you kind of understand how the, the, the story kind of plays itself out and kind of historically the timeline, I'm guessing that Silas was probably there. Because later on, when, when, when Saul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem to kind of work out some of the logistics, Silas is there with the apostles. My guess is that he's probably somewhere there. I don't know, but I'm guessing... Could you imagine if could you imagine if at Stephen Stoning you had Saul, soon to be Paul, and Barnabas, who would go out on the first couple of uh, missionary trips, and Silas? It finishes it, it? Could you imagine who's watching Stephen stand up for this Jesus that he knows and loves? God who waits tables. Oh my goodness. Who's watching you? Who's watching you? Could you imagine in these moments where God places you in place with a message from him, a word from him, 
an opportunity to serve a brother at work, or an opportunity to minister to someone who's, who's hurting, or an opportunity to, to love on someone who's, who's got cancer or that, that's struggling with, with, with life issues. And God places you in position. If you open your mouth and you speak, could you imagine the people that are watching? Yes. I think I said this, whoa, week one, which was probably 15, 14 months ago. I think I've been coming here for about a year and a half at this point. Something like that. And I believe I said way back then, I have no clue why God has allowed this church to go through what it's gone through, but this church has stayed strong, it's stood, it's been close together, it's loved one another, you've supported each other, you continue to get the, have the gospel preached here and outside. I'm saying God has positioned you to do something major. Could you imagine who's watching you? Who's watching you? Who, who's listening? Who's, who's tuning in to see what's happening at Five Stone in Elizabethtown? Your best days are not behind you. They're still to come. Amen. 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 Do you know what happened as a result of this moment here? Here's what happened. Number one, the persecuted church spreads north. That's interesting. So there, I don't know, I'm going to use my arm just to help you. If Jerusalem is kind of here, you know, if there were a button here, it would be there. <laughs> Because of the persecution of Stephen, the gospel starts to go heading north actively. Philip, and, and, and you'll see it through Damascus, through Samaria, right? Jesus said, hey, take my gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the old ends of the earth. So it starts heading north. Ultimately, it makes its way to Antioch. Barnabas goes later on, it's probably 11 years later, he goes and finds Paul, brings them back to Antioch, they start leading there in Antioch, and then the, the church says, hey, why don't you go out there and, and take that gospel further than this? And so the gospel then leaves Antioch and starts heading west into Turkey or Asia Minor and, 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 and uh, Cyprus and Cilicia and such going through that region where you get your epistles, your Philippians and Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, all of those. It starts going Macedonia. It hits Europe. The gospel hits Eastern Europe. And it starts spreading through Eastern Europe, you know, Rome and, and, and Greece, and, and ultimately it gets, it gets to England. And then some pilgrims get on a boat and head to America. America. That gospel gets brought to America. And ultimately it gets brought to Elizabethtown, Nashville, Knoxville, you name it, California. I think the gospel's in California. <laughs> Might be a little bit. A little bit. It's hard to say. <laughs> it's hard to say. We, 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 oh, I'm kidding, California. We love you. The gospel spreads. That happens because of Stephen. Because of Stephen. It's this moment. It's this man who says, I'm going to say what God has called me to say in the moment that he gives me. I'm not going to be afraid of who is, who, who's around me. I know who I am. I know who I am in Christ. I know where I'm going. I know what I believe. I'm going to share this message if it kills me. Because if it kills me here, I'm going home. I'm going home. Could you imagine if we had this conviction? Here's what else happened. Saul would have seen this. Saul, who's holding coats and, 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 and you, know, the, 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 um, you know, the robes of the people who are stoning him, would have seen this young man who had no training in the, in the Sanhedrin, who had no training from some you know, high priest, and he was seeing this ordinary guy who's willing to lay down his life for this message that he believes. Saul is, is there, and he's saying, whoa, this is how, okay, the Old Testament, does it really point to this Jesus guy? And if you look at some of Paul's writings and some of his preachings, he's using a lot of these dots that Stephen has connected, and Paul used them in his uh, sermons. The church gets empowered and strengthened. Right? They're now seeing this condition of this man. They're being bold enough to go out there and bring the gospel themselves. If Stephen can do it, I can do it. And they go out there and they bring 
unashamedly the gospel as far as they possibly can because of Stephen. Because Stephen speaks. What happens if we do that? What happens if wherever God has sent us, wherever God plants us, whoever we're around, we're bold enough to speak his word unapologetically, unashamedly, to say, God, if this is the moment you've given me, I'm going to use this. I'm going to give my life for it because you gave me everything. You gave all of your life for me. How dare I not give all my life for you? Amen. Amen. Could you imagine what God could do if each one of us walked with that type of conviction? And I was thinking, I wrote a note to myself here. Um, technically, I wouldn't be here today. Technically, I would be here next week. It's amazing that, you know, I was look, you know, as I was thinking about this, it's amazing that today is your, you know, Memorial Day tomorrow, where we where we celebrate the fallen heroes who have fought for our freedom, that have laid down our li their lives for us. And I think here's a hero right here who has laid down his life. For the gospel. Amen. Ultimately, Amen. for us. Amen. Memorial Day. As we recognize first responders, <laughs> military, and those that are, you know, public safety, providing public safety for us. Why not throw in there some of the martyrs who have laid down their lives to preserve the gospel message? Whose, whose stories we can look at and, and, and allow it to fuel us so that we can go out even more boldly and deliver the gospel message of a Savior who loves us Amen. so much that he laid down his life to redeem us. Amen. Stephen speaks and says, hey guys, don't miss it. All throughout history, we, we, we've looked at what God has made and we've missed the maker We've mishandled what God has done. When God, by his Holy Spirit, was moving, we, we've mishandled that. And we, 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 we reasoned it away. And Stephen says, no, let's not do that anymore. Let's recognize that God is doing something in our day, in our time. Let's recognize that. And let's operate with it. Let's focus ourselves on the maker, on who he is. Not what we can do. Not our ability. Not what it looks like. But who he is, what he's promised, what he's done, and what he continues to do. Would you pray for me? Lord, I appreciate your word. It is my heart to simply deliver your word, to read it, to explore what it says, to think about what it looked like in that day, and to to maybe reason what that looks like today, how it applies to us. And so, God, I pray that I've been faithful enough with handling your word. And I pray that as we've read and as we've looked at Stephen, as we've, we've thought through what he's done and maybe think about where we are today, I pray that your word has landed on good ground, that our hearts are convicted, that our spirits are encouraged, that we remember and recognize who you are, we wouldn't be here today doing this if it wasn't for your saving grace. So we thank you for your saving grace. We thank you. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't do it. Our blood couldn't handle the burden. But yours did. So we appreciate that. God, because of what you've done and how much you love us, and we understand it's not just that you love us. You so love the world. And because of that, you've sent us in our humanity, empowered by your spirit, to go out into the world and share this message. May we do so faithfully. Lord, may we open our mouths when it's time to speak. We have no clue who will be watching. We have no clue what the catalyst for change would be. But Lord, if you would use us, we're willing. Here we are. We're available. Lord, I pray for this church. God, I pray that you would use this church, this body of individuals, each person individually and collectively as a body of Christ to go out there and share your message in their neighborhoods, homes, jobs, communities, wherever that looks like, Lord, would you allow them to speak? People watching, 
may we represent you well. If there's anyone in here that's discouraged, Lord, would you encourage them? May they realize and know they are not alone. You work with them. You promised your spirit would work with them. Anyone in here who's feeling weakened, less than, God, you said you would strengthen them. Would you give them strength? Anyone here who feels like they're in a, a place of turmoil or chaos, may we have peace. Peace. Like Stephen experienced, just unexplainable peace. Would you give that right now? Anyone here who's feeling, oh, I don't know if I can do that, may we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And may we respond to what you're doing in boldness, empowered by you. God, I thank you for this opportunity to read and hear your word. We pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, five song. God bless you. Have an incredible Sunday. Enjoy Monday. Go out there and speak. Amen. Go ahead. Amen.